So what is my six part plan to overcome adversity? Here it is. Number one, find confidants and mentors. Number two, cultivate friends, old and new. Number three, my favorite one, laughter therapy. Number four, love your body. Number five, find your passion. And number six, mindfulness, live in the present. So those are the six, and I'm gonna go into more details on what they're all about. So first of all, choosing confidants and mentors. So what should they do? They should be providing you with useful advice and very importantly, keeping things confidential. I had a few friends that I had confided in some of my deepest, darkest thoughts when I was going through, in, first found out about my ex-husband's infidelity. Um, one of them was uh, very interested in passing all these details on to his circle and, and letting everybody know about um, my dirty laundry. Nope, that's not what you want. You want a confidant who does keep things confidential. These are important people to have as a sounding board, as a way of venting, because some of your friends are not gonna wanna hear all that negativity. They're not gonna wanna hear you being down and depressed and venting how bad things are. Um, but a confidant or a mentor, that will be something that they will be willing to do and they will give you useful advice. They can be friends, they're more than friends, they're not just friends, because as I said, some friends will not, either not be able to keep things confidential or not be able to provide you much useful advice, or they would not really wanna hear all the negativity. But friends or paid counselors, very, very important. And if you're having problems in your career, if you're having problems at work, um, if you're having problems with coworkers, confidentiality is really, really important. You do not want what you say about somebody else and what you're trying to work through in your environment, in your work environment, to be spilling over to those other folks you're working with. Confidentiality, very important. And the other thing is, uh, it's better to have both male and female confidants and mentors because you're going to get a very different view about what's going on from a male than you will from a female, both in terms of your professional life and in terms of your personal life. So that is the story about choosing confidants and mentors. Now we move on to point number two, cultivating friends old and new. I let go of so many of the friends I've had prior to my marriage, once I was sort of nose to the grindstone with my husband in our relationship, working on our joint business, raising the children, looking after the house, ministering to him, all of that. And I let go a lot of very, very good friends from my uh, my singleton days. So you might want to revisit friends that you've let go because sometimes you let go of friends without even realizing you've done that. And these may be people who know you very well, who have uh, with whom you have a lot of fun. And so you really do need a strong community of friends. And you can do activities to make new friends. If you have interests in certain things, then you're going to meet people who are kindred spirits in those activities. So think about that. Making friends, having a community is very, very important. Initiate conversations. Now, obviously, I'm not saying you should go and um, dig out strangers and maybe um, you know get yourself into trouble with people that you shouldn't be talking to, but initiate conversations with people you don't know. You can talk to people you meet in the grocery line. You can talk to people that you meet lining up for coffee at the, you know, at the vending machine at work. You can, or whatever it is, initiate conversations, get to know people, make comments, make little lighthearted jokes. That will build community. It's always a good idea to, to talk to people. I remember my sister said to me, she envied the way that I was able to strike up conversations with people I didn't know. It's an attitude of mind to do that. It's an attitude of mind, and it means that you, you don't have to take yourself too seriously. You just initiate conversations, build human connections. And again, it's good if you cultivate both male and female friends because males and females will give you very different pictures of, of life. So that's, that's the story about cultivating friends, old and new. Laughter therapy. Well, I was brought up on a diet of Monty Python. 
my parents would let us stay up late when I was growing up to watch it on television. It was on really late. And uh, and we watched all the shows. And my parents even let us go and see one of the episodes being filmed. That was the highlight of my childhood. So laughter therapy. Find friends who bring you up, not down. Friends who make you laugh. Friends who don't make you feel depressed, who don't criticize you. Friends who are people you can have a good time with. Now, when I went through breast cancer and I went through infidelity at the same time, I gave up watching the news, despite the fact that I was a former BBC journalist. As a former BBC journalist, I always kept up with world affairs. But the news is always about bad news. It doesn't bring you up. And I felt that it was not helping me to watch the news. Instead, I watched comedies and not depressing dramas. So humor also has a place at work as well as at play, because think about it. You're giving a speech. What kind of speech do people tend to remember? They remember the speeches that had humor in them because they lighten the mood. They add humanity and joy to the presentation. Because without humor, we have no humanity. Without humor, we're choosing misery rather than joy. So think about it. Bring some humor into your workplace. Doesn't mean you're not taking your work seriously, but it means you're taking yourself a little bit less seriously, which is always a good thing to do. And it also means that you are making other people smile. And when you make others smile, you make them feel better and you make them like you. And that is definitely a good thing. They say laughter is the best medicine. And there is even laughter yoga, which is a practice from India where you laugh and it supposedly has all kinds of therapeutic benefits. Well, I wouldn't really want to have to do forced laughter. I like laughter that comes naturally from watching comedies, being with people whose company I enjoy and just having a lighter attitude towards life. So laughter therapy, very important. And then the next point, love your body. Love your body and become beautiful. Now, of course, I don't mean that you're going to become a supermodel. I'm not going to become a supermodel. I'm talking about inner beauty and loving your body enough to look after it well. So that means healthy eating, not binge eating, not missing meals, not eating a lot of processed food, enjoying your food, but eating whole food, real food. And eating meals with others is a wonderful way to connect. So healthy eating. Exercise. Exercise really does banish the blues, especially outdoor exercise. I've seen research that shows that exercise is a much more effective antidote to depression than antidepressants. And I'm serious. Exercise banishes the blues. And exercise is not sitting in front of your screen. That awful stereotype of the woman that's been left by her man lying in bed, spooning ice cream from the tub, watching television and just lying there. That is about the worst thing you can do and it is not going to lift the depression. Getting out there, moving your body, being in nature, that is what is going to banish the blues. That's what loving your body is about and that's what will make you feel better. And then the final point in terms of loving your body, good sleep habits. There's a great book by Arianna Huffington called The Sleep Revolution. And she is appalled by the way that people brag about not needing a lot of sleep. Um, even somebody like Bill Clinton has said in public that all his worst decisions were made because he didn't get enough sleep. So whether you agree with that or not, good sleep habits are very, very important. In fact, in fact, for example, driving without having had enough sleep is often worse than driving drunk. And uh, sleep is very important for recharging the body and for boosting your mood 
and for regulating your weight, all kinds of things. Sleep is extremely important. So the things you can do are trying to go to bed and wake up at around about the same time, trying to avoid screen time and blue light for at least an hour before going to bed. So that means no computer, no television, no looking on your screen for about an hour or even two hours before you go to bed. And that will make a difference in terms of the quality of your sleep. It's also a good idea to even in the, especially in the evening to use the blue filter on your screen and to have the blue filter on your glasses. If you wear glasses, those are, those are good things to do. I do have a blue filter on my glasses. I'm not wearing them now because when I do that, I get this weird reflection on Zoom and all these weird blue lines and blue reflections show up in the screen. So I do have a special pair of non-blue blocking glasses that I only use for Zoom, but if I'm not on Zoom, I have blue blocking glasses. So I would definitely recommend those for when you're doing um, any work on the screen. So find your passion. What does that mean? Most of us, especially women, spend so much time nose to the grindstone, just getting on with what is necessary and often we're just ministering to our our guys if we you know if we're if we have more say traditional marriages but that doesn't make your heart sing so think about what makes your heart sing what makes your heart sing music art volunteering a business idea there's got to be something that makes you feel like getting up every morning I'm not saying you should necessarily give up your day job if all you've if you've always wanted to say play the saxophone and you just want to start that up. No, you're not necessarily going to be able to make the same kind of living doing that as you were in your day job. But you may have a really amazing business idea that you could in time give up your day job for. But work at that because life is short. One thing that having breast cancer twice taught me is that we all have an expiration date. And if not now, when? So if you're not enjoying what you're doing, find your passion. Try to remember what it was that you did in the past that you loved that made your heart sing. And go for that. We all need a reason to get up each morning. And on this point, I want to tell you, success is not the same as purpose. You can be very successful in your career. You can be making a lot of money. You can be having a very, very uh, high level lifestyle, beautiful house, fine car, jewelry, or whatever it is. But that is not the same as purpose because success is really only for you. It's for the benefit of you. Purpose is not only for the benefit of you, it's for the benefit of others. And if you feel that your life has purpose and that you're doing something that not only benefits you, but that benefits others, that is a deep, deep feeling of satisfaction. Because with success, you know, you could make your first million, but it's not enough. It doesn't feel as good as you thought it would. So what, what do you have to do? You have to go off and make the second million. And it also doesn't make you feel any better. With purpose, what you're achieving does satisfy. It does bring you satisfaction. It does bring you happiness. So think about that. Success is not the same as purpose. The final point in my six part plan is probably the hardest one for me. And it's definitely still a work in progress. So mindfulness, being in the present, living in the present, and the basic point here is that the past is gone, and yet so much of our time we spend churning it in our heads. I mean, you don't necessarily even need to have had adversity to regret the past and to think about, oh, I should have done it this way, and what if I'd have done it that way, and you know, and 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 I let this go, and this business project could have done, it could have gone better, and and, and I'm not happy about this that's happened. Well, it doesn't matter; it's gone. And the future, you can worry about what might happen in the future, but currently the future is fiction. It doesn't exist. All we have is the now. And if you aren't focusing on the present, you're in effect not choosing life. 
you know, because so many of us, we may be in a wonderful, beautiful place, wonderful scenery. We may be with great people, fantastic conversations, beautiful surroundings. But if our minds are elsewhere, if we're worrying about stuff that's happened in the past or what might happen in the future, we aren't enjoying the present. We're missing out on the wonder of, of the now. And so many people live life that way. And what I would say to you is, although it's impossible to always live in the now and not think about the past and not think about the future, try to do it more because you will have more enjoyment. And the way I would say it is, is this. Imagine a party. It's a great party, fantastic food, wonderful people, great music. And if you go there and you're focusing on what's going on, you're going to have a good time. You're living in the present. You're enjoying it. But say you've just been dumped by your boyfriend or you've had a business project that hasn't gone well and all you can do is think about that. So you go to that party and your present is very, very different from somebody who is actually focusing on what's going on. You're not enjoying it because your mind is not there. So think about it. Think about being more mindful. Think about letting go of the past and letting go of the future. Doesn't mean you aren't planning. Doesn't mean you don't pay your bills for the future. Doesn't mean you don't do things that for now that will benefit you in the future. It just means you don't churn about the future. You don't churn about the past. And one thing that I have that you might be interested in, I'm a committed chocoholic, and there is a wonderful chocolate mindfulness exercise that I didn't invent. It was, um, it, it comes from England and school kids in England do it to learn to become more mindful. All you need to do it is a wrapped piece of chocolate. And if you'd like to do that exercise, I have it as a video on my website. And it's a wonderful exercise that uses all the senses. It uses sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell, all of them, and works at taking the time to really enjoy this piece of chocolate, enjoy the feel of it in your hand, enjoy unwrapping it, enjoy smelling the wonderful chocolate fragrance when you put it to your nose, and then Feel it in your mouth and taste it in your mouth and then finally swallow it. It's a great exercise. So check that out because that's going to help you become more mindful. And it's a great practice. Whatever you do, whether you're making the bed, cleaning your teeth, whatever you're doing, try to be more mindful. Use it as a practice and you will find that your life becomes more focused and more happy.